Uh, hello, good afternoon, morning, welcome, evening to everybody who has joined us here to celebrate and give Roger a giant splash on this special day. Uh, because many of us, many of you, have been working behind the scenes for untold months, weeks, years, in fact, to bring these things about. And today we can reveal what everyone's been up to and uh, do so very proudly. So thank you for all joining us and uh, letting us get this, uh, this party off with a bang. Uh, I'm celebrating with a cup of invisible Cheshire cat tea and I toast all of you who are here. Dame Edna said she couldn't make it, so she asked me to step in and roast and toast and keep things moving on your behalf uh, so we can let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, you're already, you're amazingly good because you're quiet, you're muted, I love that. Uh, and of course, unmute whenever you feel like uh and want to chip in we've got our star guests who are kind of featured in the albums and the films and things so we want you to be uh the center of attention and but we also want to invite questions there'll be a q a big big time at the end and feel free to open your chat window and start chit chatting to each other or to everybody or just making snarky comments as you please uh but we'll we'll open the floor in general to everyone kind of towards the end. But in the meantime, we've got oh, a little bit more welcoming and then we'll go through each of the four featured pieces uh, one by one with the featured artists and uh, hopefully learn something in the process. So uh, this is being recorded for YouTube posterity, but I can't edit if any of you sneezes or the cat walks in front of the camera at an inopportune time. So, uh, yeah, here we are. I, I guess I should say I'm Philip Blackburn, now president, for what it's worth, of Numa Records, president, uh, flunky mailboy, and uh, sole proprietor of Numa Records, which sort of fell into my hands three years ago, uh, after 30 years or so at Innova Recordings. And now this is what I do uh, with my laptop, my cat, and all of you wonderful artists out there in music land. And so 50 some year, uh, fifty some albums later, one of the ones that I inherited off the bat is now here and ready to share with you. So um, some things come out quicker than others, but this is a special day for a reason is here. And I asked Thomas May, who wrote some incredible liner notes for the incredible booklet, which we'll show you in a minute, to kind of give an overview of Roger and what there is special about his music and for the Reynoldsian neophytes, what to look out for, what, are, what to pay attention to, and why he's such a special guy. Does that sound fair enough, Thomas? Are you there? Yes, indeed. Okay. Thank you, um, Philip. And um, I'm, I'm really so grateful that, that Numa Records has produced for a reason um, and has produced it so beautifully. I, I think and I'm very grateful that this is helping to circulate Roger's uh, incredible music. So I should say that um, the remarks I've uh, prepared here are really intended for that neophyte audience. So perhaps they'll, they'll be useful when, when they join us um, uh, at, in, in, in future, um, whenever on YouTube uh, via the recording of, of, of this uh, celebration. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was just last month that, um, that Roger was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And during that ceremony, the Academy praised Roger as, quote, an independent and a maverick, establishing himself as a brilliant and tireless explorer of music's possibilities, end quote. And I think that attitude of being a brilliant and tireless explorer actually applies not only to Roger's music, but to all of his life's work uh, as a teacher, as a mentor, a, a writer, a thinker. And of course, a collaborator, as, as all the brilliant guests here uh, today are well aware. Um, and a key, I think, to that spirit of exploration is that for Roger, composing isn't a separate compartment of, of activity. It's, it's, um, it's actually something that feeds off everything that he experiences and feels and encounters in his life. So if you just take a passing glance at, at some of the topics that have inspired Roger Reynolds over his incredibly prolific career, 
uh, you'll see that um, how widely varied his interests are. Uh, you, you, get a, you get a sense of, uh, sorry about that. You get a sense of how widely varied his interests are. For example, um, the experience of, of sounds in and through space and how this can be used to shape a piece, um, how sounds can be manipulated through contemporary technology. These are certainly ongoing topics in his work, but he also explores musical practices as old fashioned as virtuosity. Um, and along with that, it's philosophical implications. Um, now those things I just mentioned, they might be seen as, as part of the absolute music end of the spectrum, but there, 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 there are also powerful musical responses to be found in Roger's work um, from his responses to literature, to painting, to photography, to dance, theater, and practices from non-Western cultures. All that figures prominently in, in Roger's over as well, along with experiments that blend disciplines beyond the realm of music. And he, he's been doing that. Uh, for such a long time, far, uh, far before this, this became a uh, much more fashionable practice, actually. Um, Roger's work shows a fascination with mirrors, their illusions and distortions, with dreams, with the phenomenon of time, with multiple perspectives on a musical event. In fact, they sometimes suggest a kind of musical equivalent to Kurosawa's film Rashomon, um, and on Numa's new double album, we get examples from both sides of that spectrum, that is pieces of, of absolute music uh, and pieces that engage with extra musical inspirations. So for example, the last piece on For, for a Reason, uh, which is called Sketchbook, for the unbearable lightness of being, originated as far back as the mid 1980s and was originally imagined as a kind of late night piece for a nightclub setting. Um, that would take place after the big show. But the other three works are of more recent vintage, and they were all created within the past dozen or so years. And they give you a taste of how tireless and varied Roger's creativity remains, even as he's approaching his 90th birthday, which takes place next year. Um, I think Roger's music really invites a different kind of listening. And I think it's a listening that encourages our own creativity. Um, there's nothing habitual with his music. There's nothing that comes by default. Even when he's worked out an overall concept for a series, like the two works from the Share Space uh, series on this album, which are performed respectively by, by Irvine Arditi and, and Pablo Gomez Cano, uh, each one calls for a unique approach and architecture, and each contains its special surprises. Roger is always reinventing not only the rules, but what the stakes are that are involved when he undertakes a new project. What the stakes are. Um, that's another important point that I think uh, should be emphasized when, when we talk about Roger's overall outlook as an artist. It's never about just experimenting merely for the sake of experimenting. What drives all of this is a desire to provoke meaningful responses that somehow engage and reward those who listen to Roger's music. And I, I certainly strongly encourage you to see Kyle Johnson's film for a reason, uh, which Numa's making available, I believe, through the end of the month, um, and which is, of course, the a source of, of the album's title, For a Reason. It's a beautifully innovative documentary that addresses this ultimate question from Roger's perspective. Why create such challenging art. So with that, I think- And with that segue, may, may I pass the baton and invite you to come back with any further comments Absolutely. in a moment. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so yeah, Kyle, if you wanna queue up your aforementioned documentary clip here, uh, featuring Pablo, who is first up on the album, and then we'll have Pablo and Paul chit chat about what's going on. Are you there?
most composers that have really made a mark have they have a kind of sound or a space that is established in an amazingly short period of time. So a piece, you know, comes on, let's say you're listening to the radio and you're driving. And within 20, 30 seconds, you know that's Stravinsky. That's Takamitsu. That's Feldman, something like that. Zanakis. People who really have a Their sensibilities are so finely honed and they have used them in such a variety of ways over such a long period of time that they know where things ought to be. Can I quickly I'm say- seeing Kyle's screen there? Excuse me? I, I'm seeing some nods. W were you able to see that clip? Yes. Okay, good. I've got some screen confusion here. Good. Okay, I'd just like to say quickly that the power and subtlety of Pablo's playing was at first to me almost alarming. He can do things with rascado technique and so on that produce sensibilities that I never thought guitars were able to do. But of course, under his guidance, they do. Notable, particularly for me, is his sign-off. He frequently writes at the end of a message, we are in touch. And I love the idea of that tactility in a communication channel. And about Paul, who was the partner with uh, Pablo in the clip you just saw, Paul continues to be a, a kind of nourishing uh, person to collaborate with, to interact with. Uh, he's a pleasure to work with, and he has this rare combination of capacities. He's technically expert and reliable, which is crucial in terms of working with technology, uh, but he also has a kind of interactive musicality, which suits duo playing of this sort. Uh, the share space uh, works perfectly. Pablo, tell us, what's it like? Oh, he left. Did now I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> yes, incredible when things happen. Is it my turn to now? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry for this, uh, whatever happened. So uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. It's a privilege to me to be in such a fantastic company. Uh, this project is a career top project for me in, in, in my career. And so I'm very grateful uh, with Roger. So there, there are many, uh, many things to say uh, in, in short time, but I will start saying that, for example, Luciano Berio, when he wrote his Sequenza for guitar, he said that the modern guitar was the convergence of, um, of the flamenco tradition in Spain and the classical tradition. But I would say that Dream Mirror <laughs> would be the convergence of flamenco, classical, all sorts of electric guitar techniques, uh, and in Latin American techniques, and even some uh, Asian uh, instruments techniques. No? So uh, I would say that it's, a, in a way, a, a manifesto of the possibilities of the articulation of sound in the guitar. And this is just uh, the beginning. This is just one layer of it. No? Uh, after that, uh, we have the we have the electronics, no, that, that, uh, that the, the idea that the computer musician works like chamber music, no, with the possibility of also making interpretations. And I have had the opportunity to play this piece with three different uh, computer musicians. Uh, and, and I can, you know, I, I, I have been witnessed uh, uh, that it's possible actually to do that. No, everyone it, it, with the same music, with the same, uh, uh, algorithms, <laughs> they are managed to make their own versions. And this is, I think, is fantastic. No, I, I think that this, uh, these pieces are the most advanced uh, uh, in the sense of, of the relations between instruments 
and electronic. And, <clears throat> uh, and of course, and most importantly, is that everything, all this is united with the musical language of a, a true poet of the 21st century, no? Uh, like like uh, Roger. Uh, so, um, so yes, uh, I think that the, the Dream Mirror is something that uh, is very important for, for my career. And as uh, you were, someone was saying before that, you know, that it, it requires some creative audi uh, audition when people listen to it. That's, uh, that I think it's, it's very engaging. And when people do it, they really get mesmerized with, with, with this music. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm totally happy to be here. Uh, I, if, uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Shall we uh, move on to the next excerpt, which is with Irvin, and then we'll invite Paul to uh, contribute your experiences being that computer musician for so many talented people. <laughs> Pretty amazing. I got a bit behind. Yeah, after, but I mean, after a few minutes, I got a bit behind. And... All in all, it's there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't it be? Irvin, mean, tell us, how do you do it? Um, how do I do it? I think Roger does it first, <laughs> and then. I need Roger to do it first. I mean, in the in the first talk, Thomas said his music provokes um, meaningful responses. I think that's particularly relevant to this piece um, because in a way I'm responding to what I hear. Um, in this example, it's a rather melodic example. I think it's the end of the piece, um, but there are other examples where the, the computer is doing lots of uh, staccato things, and I'm commenting on that with spiccato music, Balzato playing. Um, the piece goes through various phases, and correct me if I'm wrong, Roger, it's all me on the tape, isn't it? Yes. All the sounds come from yes. violin. So it's... Record, yeah, we're recording specifically of you playing the same passages that were the sources of the computer mo modifications. Yeah, so it's a bit like... Um, of an Arditi orchestra, um, a rather bad Malkovich film, maybe, or a good film, um, where every player is me, but in in a different guise, and I'm reacting to myself all the time. And I, I think it really does influence uh, the way I play, because you can do lots of things on the violin, you, and I'm responding all the time to what I hear when I have time to do that. Um, it's a very melodic piece, as you heard in that in that small excerpt. And I think it's a very special piece of Roger's output in regard to my relationship with him, which spans now more than 40 years. 
and started with his first string quartet. Um, I've seen how Roger's music has transformed over the years. Um, I've seen how Roger has transformed over the years. And in a way, we've we've grown together um, in different places, in different ways. But it's very nice to know someone. I mean, I know many composers, but some of them are friends, but some of them are real friends. And Roger is a real friend, as well as having composed lots of pieces for myself or the quartet. So that's something that's very special and we can enjoy things other than music. music. And this, I think this, um, it makes, makes the whole relationship musically much more interesting when you really like someone. Um, you, want, you want them to like what you're doing. You want them to like the interpretation you're giving. I mean, that's true for most composers, but it's it's very special with someone who you who you care for. And I think the situation is obviously mutual. I don't know whether Roger did this with the other pieces, um, but he certainly sent me passages for my opinion of technically how they would work on the instrument. And I said, yeah, I, I can play this, I can play that. And he said, no. I want you to enjoy playing this and that. And I think no other composer has ever said that to me. Enjoy. <laughs> Many composers have made me suffer. <laughs> and I don't mind suffering, always rising to a challenge. But, um, but Roger wanted me to enjoy playing this piece. And I do enjoy it. I mean, I, I've... I started playing pieces many years ago with with electronic tapes violin and electronic tapes and you're absolutely in a straitjacket when you play music like this and um of course we progressed down and now using electronics in such a way that it becomes another instrument another player and Paul was marvelous um in the interaction of this particular piece so I feel I've grown with Roger over many years both as as a person as a composer and me as a violinist and I'll just repeat what Pablo said a few minutes ago. Roger is a true, true poet of not only the 21st century, but also the 20th. Thank you, Irvin. So, Paul, tell us about being that the, the other half of this uh, uh, set of duos. Um, so, hmm. Yes, it was extremely rewarding, of course. And like Pablo said, you know, this was definitely a sort of career highlight um, selection of pieces that I got to work on. Um, and I'm also extremely grateful for, um, you know, the work of the, uh, the other folks, um, specifically Kyle documenting things. And, and Thomas, your uh, liner notes are really amazing. So <laughs> thank you for all the work um, everybody put into this project. Um, yeah, and I guess well, I have some prepared notes here, and they relate to um, all of the pieces. I guess I'm on three of the pieces here, um, but I, I sort of wanted to point out some things related to the way um, the way Roger works, and some of the, some of my notes, uh, I guess, rhyme with some things that Tom was talking about, um, and a little bit with what we're going to talk about here with provocations. Um, so. Uh, the one thing that I spotted in the liner notes that I really liked, um, there was a, a quote from Roger, um, and it reminded me of, you know, working with him in various capacities over the years. Um, I think it's about 12 years now that, that I've been working with Roger. Um, so Roger says, um, and this is basically related to working out um, these pieces in terms of building them and then, you know, working with collaborators on them like um, Irvin and Pablo. Um, so uh, the term used in science and mathematics, successive approximation applies here as well. You just keep looking at the things you have posited and, and determine whether they are playing out in a productive way. Should I proceed or redefine? That's what I always do and that's what I have always done. And this is a quote from Roger. And I think this is interesting because it, it relates to the word sensibility, which Roger talks about with um, his composition students. Um, you basically have to keep querying your sensibility when looking at the material that you're developing. 
Um, and this is from beginning sketches through the end of the process. And it also happens in, you know, working on uh, the electronic sounds for these pieces. So you're essentially, you know, you're developing your compositional voice uh, or you are developing the sort of instantiation of your compositional voice for the specific piece in mind. So I guess I have some uh, items that are sort of uh, that I'm privy to because I was Roger's assistant for many years so far. Um, and we might first wonder, well, what might have influenced Roger's sensibility outside of other music? Um, and so these are, these are just sort of slightly amusing asides I, in a way. But so I worked on Roger's um, catalog in his library um, and found that he is voraciously consumed uh, 1530 books on many subjects. <laughs> so that's a you know, working on your own sensibilities there. Um, and then uh, related to, you know, working on acquiring your sensibility for a specific piece of music. Um, so many of Roger's computer music pieces rely on short samples that we call seeds. Um, these are um, small recorded segments. They're sort of like the size of a motive. Um, and they're usually done by the, the performer in question here. So uh, at least in the case of um, dream area and shifting drifting it's all Pablo or all Irvin um, and these seeds are uh, basically we gather them up and then we um, spin out the seed into these sort of like you know the Malkovich like uh, being John Malkovich being Irvin Arditi you know orchestra sized um, you know instantiations of these seeds so uh, you can hear me correct I, I believe somebody else's no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so specifically related to shifting drifting, um, and this is something that I had access to all of the files that we used to create this um, piece. Um, and so initially Roger actually um, did a lot of recording for this and, you know, there's several hours of original violin material. Um, and then Roger and I windowed that down to 260 draft seeds. So these were like the hypothetical seeds. And then using this successive approximation approach that he talks about, um, we winnowed down, winnowed them down to 48 seeds that are actually used in the piece. Um, and I should say that, you know, this is definitely like, it takes a lot of work to do this. And Roger is extremely dedicated. Um, another collaborator that we've worked with in the past, uh, Mark Dresser, um, Mark and I joked around about the Roger can really work almost anyone under the table. Like he is, an amazingly hard worker and it's like uh, it's really like you know humbling uh, to work on these pieces with roger he's so you know um capable of you know um you know persevering um and getting things done so it's really great um and i just I, i'll tack on one final thing here which is an amazing anecdote so the the first piece that i actually worked on with roger was a um a new production of Ping, uh, which Thomas talks about in the liner notes as well. And the other, our, the collaborators for that specific performance was, it was Ross Carr and Rachel Beats, um, the percussionist and the flute player. So an amusing detail is that the, I had to replace, or I thought I needed to replace these original Japanese electric motors that uh, Roger uses to excite the piano strings. Um, and however, I could not find any electric motors in all of San Diego that were capable of the torque needed <laughs> to get the job done. And so I just ended up resoldering the connections on the original Japanese motors because they were so powerful. And I guess you could say that they don't really make them like they used to. So. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll give tech a rest for a moment while we move on to Steve and a clip from here and there. Take it away with Kyle. If there was a way out, if I said there was a way out, make me say it. Have a mother, I'd have a tomb. I wouldn't 
have come out of here. One doesn't come out of here. to begin that's my life wow Eve take it away it looks like you're doing global car on many many steroids <laughs> perhaps that's right uh, thank you so much, uh, Philip, and and thanks to my friends and colleagues on this in this meeting, and uh, with special thanks to Roger for not just the percussion music, but for these years of friendship, collegiality, and and common cause. I have a, a slightly different perspective of working with Roger than many others do because we've been colleagues at the University of California in San Diego since I arrived thirty two years ago by now. And um, and as a, as a result, we've worked on music in the context of the institution that nourished it. And that's been a special kind of joy. Um, the, the, the percussion music goes back, uh, for me at least, to a piece called Autumn Island, which was a marimba solo not written for me, but written in the mid 1980s for a group of rising stars amongst marimbists. Uh, but the pieces that we have done together, including Watershed and Sanctuary and Here and There, which you just saw, uh, have progressed um, in this kind of remarkable, along this remarkable line of, of, of giving the performer increasing agency over the result of the, of, the, of, of the piece. And that, I think, is something which I am, I mean, that's something I'm very, very grateful for, because Roger trusts performers. And as Irvin said, this is not always the case that a composer will, will have this kind of affinity for the act of performing, this kind of trust in the players in, in, in whom he places these, these notes, so that very, very often in rehearsals, and I think probably the other performers can really um, uh, you know, relate to this, things can change. Roger will say in a, in a, in a rehearsal, um, well, if you do it that way, let's do this other thing. And, and the piece lives in this kind of way. There's not a sense that he has come down from the mountain with chiseled tablets, and this is the way it will have to be, whether you like it or not. And so there's joy in the in the act of playing the music. There's joy in the act of, of, of learning it. In particular, about here and there, um, I, I, for me, this is one of the most fascinating pieces that I've ever played, and I'll, I'll, I'll join the chorus of saying it's a career high point for me. Because of having worked with Watershed and its technological component and having worked with Sanctuary and, and, even, and in fact, even a more involved technological component, here and there is a piece without technology and with very, very few instruments. You saw two thirds of the instruments on that screen. There is a big gong, a bass drum, and then off to the side in the there position is a vibraphone. Three instruments, mallets, simple amplification of the voice uh, to, uh, to make the text legible, and, and nothing else. So I thought this was an amazing thing. Not that Roger's ever been incapable of these kinds of things, but I knew what he was very interested in doing with respect to the kind of integration of technology and performance, and to say, you know, let's just do something really, really different. That's another thing you hardly ever hear from a, from a composer. So I'm extremely grateful for it. And it's a piece that in my entire repertory gives me more agency, more flexibility and more power in the moment than, than I think practically anything else that I play. And I would include in that those, the, the solos of Zanakis. So I'm really grateful for the piece, and, and and but I'm actually also more grateful for the lineage of the process by which we arrived at this piece, which I think has been <clears throat> just so stellar. And as we sit here, uh, and as Roger, I know, can can attest, 
We are just barely 12 hours removed from a four hour recording session of his newest work, a, a piece for chorus. And, and he, so yet another experience that neither of us had done before really in this way. And when you find, forget one's actual physical age, when you find anyone with a beginner's mind, with the sense of innocence that it takes to try something new, bolstered by the extraordinary experiences of the things that are now older, um, it's just a treasure. And so, first of all, Roger, thank you for those that, for that music. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll play it for the rest of my life. Thank you, Steve. We look forward to that. And moving right along to the fourth piece we have to share, Liz Pierce, and going back in time, sketchbook. What is unique about the eye hides itself exactly in what is imaginable about the person that all we are able to imagine is what makes everyone like everyone else. What people have in common, the individual eye, is what... With a score like Sketchbook, there are a lot of demands on the performer from a lot of different angles. But at the same time, there's space to have a personality within the piece. Stock. That is what can not be guessed at or calculated. What must be. Must be. Uncovered. Liz, tell us more because. Steve come, came out this as a percussionist with a voice, and you're coming out this maybe with as a vocalist with a piano. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've, I mean, a lot of singers do play piano in their private lives, or you know, just for warming up or in practice. And even back in like 2015 or 16, um, I was finding myself really isolated in a new city. I didn't have access to a regular collaborative pianist. And I said, okay, I'm just going to start accompanying myself um, and did. And I actually, for the last several years, that's been a part of my practice, but uh, it's sort of coalesced when a, a friend recommended this piece to me because I needed to write a dissertation. I needed to finish my time as a doctoral student and was having a really hard time finding a topic. And Roger's piece was suggested to me. And it began this long study of this piece and the sort of, um, it, it was really kind of an amazing experience to get to see see all of the notebooks, all of the sketchbooks that Roger had developing this piece back in the mid 80s. Um, and so, you know, listening to all of your experiences, I feel like, you know, I'm coming at this from a very different perspective as somebody who I've known, as you see from the video, my hair color changed and it's been a couple of years since we first started looking at this piece together. Um, and when I was doing my dissertation research back in 2018, um but so i've known roger or we've spoken for the past five years and i've only gotten to meet him twice once when i was doing that research back in 2018 and then again when i came up for the recording sessions last summer and so performing a piece that was not written for me but feels really good it you know it, it kind of there are sections that challenge my playing ability because i'm not a professional pianist um but between the vocal and the pianistic ch uh challenges this is so much fun to work my voice into and to kind of 
my entry into Roger's musical world was through this piece. All right, thank you. And moving right along here, and we'll come back to everyone in the free for all coming up. But I have a message to share from publishers. Uh, Edition Peters USA has been publishing Roger for some time now. And if I can share this screen, they have a message for you too. Hello from all your friends at Edition Peters. I'm Catherine Knight. I'm president of Edition Peters USA. I'm Owen Summers, general manager of Edition Peters USA. And I'm the vice president for New Music and Rights at Edition Peters. And his name is Jean Capriolio. We've got so many amazing stories and things to celebrate with Roger Reynolds over the years. But Jean, I think you wanted to look at, you know, the most recent exciting event. Yes, uh, I was listening to the new CD this morning, and uh, it's fantastic. And uh, it, it uh, made me think about uh, something that's been on my mind for years, uh, which is uh, how the uh, new music, contemporary concert music, uh, I think would be uh, appreciated by a much larger audience than it currently has. And, and this CD is a perfect example. The, uh, the first track, Dream Mirrors, is uh, for guitar and electronics. And as I was listening to it, there's a lot of shifting between channels. I was listening to it on headphones. And uh, I thought that it was reminiscent of uh, early Jimi Hendrix albums, like Axis Bold as Love. And that that audience would would appreciate this CD. And, and the same thing happened when I was listening to uh, Here and There, which is a piece for uh, solo percussion uh, by Steve Schick, where he speaks as well. And, and that reminded me of uh, some early Mother of Inventions albums. And, uh, and I think the fans of that, that, those types of music, Pink Floyd and, and, and the Beatles and all of the uh, 60s psychedelia and, and more recent psychedelia would appreciate this type of album. And um, I, I hope that it finds an audience among those people. So well done to all of you for this amazing achievement with this album. It's a great testament to all of you and we're so proud to be a part of Roger Reynolds and his incredible compositional output. All right, thank you folks at Peters. And just to reiterate, in case you haven't seen it, Rogers for a Reason comes with a, with a percussion instrument that you can play. Uh, you can't necessarily see it from this Cheshire Cat camera, uh, but we have a case. We've got a double CD in a beautifully designed package with a beautiful booklet. So tell all your friends, whether they have CD players or not, that they need to own this. And uh, before I pass it over, I just want to say one of the missing people on screen is Karen. Uh, working with Roger and Karen for the last few months, if not years, uh, they work as a team on something like this. And I don't know how much printer ink got, you got through back there in Del Mar. Uh, but we went through a lot of variations and uh, a lot of time discussing things back and forth. So I feel like a performer on this album. Uh, but now it is uh, out there in the world. And uh, let's open the floor to Q&A and commiserations and mutual backslapping, love fest, funny stories. Because um, we've got a little bit of time just for that. I, I could just say to begin with that as a result, partially of all the exchanges and drafts that we went through, our printer died yesterday. And it it, it sent a kind of plaintive message itself saying that it's, uh, I don't know, it's a production pad or something had died. So I, th I think we exhausted this machine. I, I do feel like that with some of my clients, but it uh, looks like your printer got ahead of me. <laughs> Roger, do you, is it time for your rebuttal? Uh, well, I realized that I broke in earlier and inappropriately uh, and and made some comments about one of the wonderful people gathered here for this uh, 
uh, unexpected and amazing occasion. And, and probably I should at least quickly explain that I had a comment or two about each, and maybe I could just quickly go over those. If that, that I mean, this certainly isn't a matter of rebuttal. Uh, I said, you know, about uh, Thomas, that being interviewed allows you uh, to discover things that you didn't know you knew. Uh, at least it brings into conscious awareness things that have lurked in your subconscious that you that that you had, let's say, either neglected or been completely unaware of. And to, so Thomas's questing nature and his curiosity and uh, dedication to uh, getting details correct is uh, both impressive and also, I have to say, personally endearing. So I already uh, mentioned something. Uh, let's see. Yes, about Pablo and about Paul and Irvin. Irvin has been a central component of my musical life, uh, both as the masterful artist he is, and also and maybe almost as important as, as a friend, a wise and often hilarious friend. My times with Irvin have been, of course, musically revelatory and provocative and satisfying and, um, you know, propellant-like, but also they've just been immensely enjoyable. And I trust that those kinds of multifaceted uh, uh, interactions will continue. So Thank you. <laughs> you are more than welcome, as you know. And they're going to continue very soon, I think. Because you're coming yes. to London next week to yes, well, the new piece. Yep, it, next it, it, it goes on. <laughs> yeah, it does. It goes on. Uh, in in terms of Steve, the first time I worked directly with him was at Arizona State University when Chinnery Ung had invited, for some reason, the both of us uh, to have a kind of residency there. And Steve wanted me to hear the marimba work that he mentioned, Autumn Island, which is a very demanding four mallet piece. And as he was playing, I realized oddly that I couldn't really hear what he was doing. And so I closed my eyes. And in order to concentrate my sensibility just on sound, and I realized that the thing that happened when I was watching is that I became so engaged in the preparatory motions that he made uh, that were, let's say, at the root of the sound that would come, uh, were so distracting that I, I, I kind of couldn't hear the sound. And I realized over the years of working with Steve in many capacities and in many contexts, that getting to the root of things is one of his most notable and admirable features. And I, I continue to be amazed by and nourished by that fact. About Liz, she first contacted me when she was uh, contemplating her doctorate subject and was focused on my uh, sketchbook for the unbearable lightness of being, which uh, works on a text by Milan Kundera, a wonderful uh, author who was at that point resident in, in Paris and whom I had interacted with uh, by correspondence a bit. She had many astute questions, and then she sent me a, <clears throat> a tape of the performance that she gave in relation to her doctorate. And I realized then very clearly that she was the wor the performer who should do they kind of, you know, let's say the basic uh, representation of that work for posterity, uh, if that's not too pompous a thing to say. And, and so it did happen uh, quite recently that she came to San Diego and not only her, her marvelous voice, whether singing or doing uh, extended uh, techniques of some sort or other, or speaking, and her pianism. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing combination of capabilities. Go figure. Uh, with Peters, 
Uh, I've been associated with that company since the early 60s. And uh, it's a kind of long and fruitful metaphoric marriage of sorts. And long may it last and flourish. The first interactions I had with Peters was with its initial president, Walter Henrichsen. And when I came into his office, whenever that was, under any circumstance over the years, he would say, Mr. Henners, what is the name of your most recent masterpiece? So he always set a high bar. And it, it was wonderful. And I continue to have this kind of uh, personal interaction with uh, Catherine Knight and Jean Capriolio, which is, uh, uh, has created a wonderful kind of, uh, you know, uh, vehicle for my getting my music into the hands of people that I don't know. Finally, Kyle and I have known each other for decades in varying capacities. And it's not only his uh, varied capabilities as a composer, as a writer, as a filmmaker uh, that uh, attracts us to one another and to collaborating, but this mysterious thing which was mentioned earlier, the sensibility, the way of looking at and feeling the world which reveals new things for us. So those are my comments and let's enlarge on this in any way people feel. Kyle, oh, we've seen some of your work, but would you like to tell us a little bit uh, about what you've been doing these last few decades, trying to reveal to us the real Roger Reynolds? Well, let's not, it's not multiple decades. Let's okay. not, uh, you know, make this seem too too violently long an experience. Um, I would just say that for anybody who has been interested by the topics we've talked about, um, this film deals exactly with them, but really from a different perspective, instead of you know, it's, it's, of course, wonderful to see the polished, finished in here, the polished, finished ideas when they've really kind of crystallized into what they should be. But for me, and then I hope for anyone who sees the film, it's only an hour and four minutes, so um, it's tight, um, that you, it's, a, it's the perspective of seeing that process of crystallization and seeing, um, you know, how these things came to you know, the perfect things that they should be, and especially seeing the different inputs into those ideas. Of course, a lot of it is Roger, but you see, um, I hope that when you see it, you'll also see a lot of the inputs of, you know, really everyone who's gathered here today um, and, and kind of how they together shaped these into what they became. Thank you. I noticed, Roger, when you first appeared in that movie, you talk about your father being an architect by profession, but also a gardener. What are you? Are you an architect or a gardener? Oh, I think they're, the same, they're, they're aspects of the same thing. The, the architect uh, shapes contexts, and the gardener works in those contexts. And I, I make often diagrammatic uh, plans for pieces. And these are not proscriptive, but they're, uh, they suggest uh, areas of opportunity, right? So that then allows me to say, okay, I have this little plot. What will I plant there? How will I uh, nourish it in the appropriate way? How will its produce or its appearance work in relationship to nearby boxes, et cetera? And I use boxes because that's what I do in my actual garden, which is just outside the windows in back of me, uh, where I have tomatoes and eggplant and uh, zucchini and green beans and so on and so on. Questions, comments? I, I was just going to say, um, Roger, do you happen to have any of the your notebooks uh, handy right next to you? Just uh, to there, there's some examples in, in, the, in the this beautifully produced uh, album booklet of uh, some illustrations of pages from yeah. your notebooks, but I think it'd be fun for perhaps the audience just to see see some examples of that. If, if I... And on that note, Thomas, I, I'll just say that as I was kind of uh, collaborating uh, on the concept of this, uh, getting materials and things from uh, from Roger and Karen to start assembling, I saw an earlier draft of the documentary, which talked about exactly such notebooks. And I said, well, we can, if we're going to have a booklet, why don't we make a simulacrum of such a notebook? 
So mm. on the right hand page, there will be text. On the left hand, there will be illustrations. So what, what you're holding in your hand there, this perfect bound thing, is meant to be on some level a metaphor for such notebooks. I love and, that. And yeah. here is one for a piano work. Uh, it's also a part of the Share Space series. And uh, uh, Jacob Sundstrom, my current technical collaborator and the pianist of the New York Philharmonic, Eric Hubner will premiere it at the Library of Congress on the 30th of October. And so you can see that as I have explained in the documentary, I write initially on the right page only, and then bit by bit, I add commentary on the left. I don't know if this will show that easily mm -hmm. or at all, but you can certainly see that it is a physical entity which contains thoughts and proposals and perhaps I don't know if we get so far as uh, diagrammatic representations but anyway you get the idea I like these notebooks to be uh, uh, sturdy and handsome and easy to carry around and I particularly favor a set of uh, notebooks that are found in a basil uh, shop near the Zacher Foundation. Mm -hmm. I, I also love out of sure. business. Yeah. yeah. Wanted to add, I, I love how how you uh, have described those as, as tunnels through time. Um, th that is your process of, of being able to really just suddenly um, hook up to a, a moment of inspiration from it could have been years ago and and get your your mind back into that state um, through this process you've developed right well there was a there was an important uh, book or article that I read many years ago that said a notepad is a channel from here to there uh, it's a channel across time and so when uh, I think of these notebooks as having conversations with myself and in the case of what uh, Liz mentioned in her comments, uh, I was able to go back and look at the original notebooks and, and comments that I had written uh, a long time before and, and, as it were, get back into that stream of thoughts and concerns and desires and mistakes and hopes. And perhaps one final question, Roger, for a reason. Why is it called that? Well, I actually, I mean, uh, to elaborate on this slightly, when I wrote a, a violin concerto for Irvin some time ago, I, I called it Aspiration. And Irvin sent an email right away and said, that's an odd title. Uh, and and so I, I explained to him uh, to what that work aspired, right? In the case of uh, For a Reason, I was similarly at first perplexed when Kyle told me what he intended to call that um, that uh, documentary work. Uh, but of course, I understood quickly uh, that that it's that's what it does, and and he described it very well. It says to people of all sorts, with all kinds of backgrounds and interests, uh, something about why it is that people uh, undertake uh, what some might see as uh, peripheral activities, like we're not saving lives, we're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, creating new kinds of seeds that that will feed uh, hundreds of millions of people in Southeast Asia or or uh, Africa and so on. But we are making things, and and so I think there are reasons for making art. And that all of us uh, who are presenters here are in that that community that believes and and cannot escape the belief that that the making of art and of course the the sharing of it and the dissemination of it is is a fundamental component of of a a functioning and significant society. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a perfect coda to this wonderful hour. And I just want to thank you all. It's a privilege to, you know, share a screen with you and uh, be working a little bit behind the scenes. And I don't want to take a moment more of your precious time.
that this is a wonderful occasion. We've got great things to share with the world. If you haven't seen the documentary, go thou and see it now. If you haven't got the CDs, rush out and buy them. And uh, we'll be seeing you for the next project. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.